University of South Dakota. And uh, we are really excited to have you here and really excited to have our class today, Dream Journals with Marcella Raymond. And she's gonna tell you a little bit about herself. Just some housekeeping things first. Um, if you have a question and you're on video, you can raise your hand and Stacy and I will be looking for those questions. You may have to unmute yourself if we can't do it for you. Otherwise, you may also use the chat function, which is located at the bottom of your screen. A white box will pop up and you can type your chat question in there. And Stacy and I will make sure that Marcella gets those questions. Um, I think that covers it. I hope, uh, I hope, I think we're ready. And uh, Marcella, please tell us a little bit about yourself. Okay, uh, my name is Marcella Raymond and I have been teaching English at the University of South Dakota now for about 22 years. Um, I teach um, all the undergraduate English courses, Intro to Lit, Intro to Composition, and my favorite, of course, creative writing. Um, I'm primarily a poet. I have a couple books of poetry. And the link I posted in the chat window is a link to Finishing Line Press, who published the two books I have out. So you can just go look at that if you want to. Um, and I'll talk a little more about dream journals in particular and, and my um, kind of fascination with dream journals as we get started with the presentation, but um, that's basically it. I'm originally from Omaha, Nebraska, um, and I moved to South Dakota in 1983, so I think I have to call myself a South Dakotan now. <laughs> I've been here long enough, so um, uh, that's, that's me, essentially. Um, so my plan for today is um, to, I have a PowerPoint presentation I want to go through, um, and then I have a little activity for us to do, and, um, and then we'll have plenty of time for discussion and questions and answers at the end of that. Um, in the meantime, just make sure, if you could make sure you have a uh, pen and paper handy um, for the activity that will help um, let's see I, I should also give you a disclaimer at the beginning <laughs> I am NOT a scientist I'm not a psychologist um, I I know what I research essentially about dreams and um, we're gonna talk a little bit about brains and um, sleep cycles and everything I know is is are things that I've researched myself so I don't have any background in sleep theory or psychology or anatomy etc so that's my big disclaimer um, so I'm gonna go ahead and try to share my PowerPoint and I think I'm kind of new at this whole Zoom class thing, but I think that when I share my screen, you'll still hear me, you just won't see me. Is that right? Okay, great. I like that. <laughs> um, okay, let me see. Let me share this. Okay, can everybody see that? Great, all right. So, um, now I have to move this little window thing. Okay, so uh, I really like this quote from Marsha Norman, dreams are illustrations from the book your soul is writing about you. Um, and we'll talk a little more about that, but um, the thing I like about that quote is that Dreams, from, from my point of view, dreams are a really personal language. So sometimes it's really fun to talk about dreams with people, and clearly I like to do that. And it's fun to 
kind of share stories and um, do some mutual interpreting. Um, but I really think it's a personal language and only you will know um, that language. And maybe that's how it should be. So, um, so the things I want to talk about are um, kind of what took me down this path of dream journaling. Um, and then I want to talk a little bit about sleep and sleep cycles, some of the some of the theories about dreams and what they mean and what their purpose is. Um, some just some tips I have from experience about improving dream recall. And then we'll get into the journals and um, I'll talk about um, just kind of how I keep journals um, and some ideas that might help you if you're interested in keeping a dream journal. And then we'll do a little practice and have some discussion. So that's my plan. Um, <clears throat> this is me back when I started keeping dream journals. And I, I started really in the 1970s when I was 15 or 16. But I lost track of those first journals. Um, many moves later, you know, I used to keep them all in a Tupperware container together. And I'm sure that container is somewhere, but I really can't tell you where now. <laughs> Packed away in my garage, probably. Um, I started because I was really curious. I have I'm one of those people who has really vivid dreams when I can remember them. And, um, and a lot of strange dreams. Sometimes I think it's a function of what I eat before I go to bed. Um, but I was just curious because every once in a while there would be something really striking about a dream. Either I would wake up and still really feel that dream. So if, if it was a really sad dream, I'd wake up and I, I would still just be sad for, you know, for a while. Um, or I would have dreams where there were names I didn't, that weren't familiar to me in my waking life. Or um, sometimes I would have dates or numbers or signs over streets, things that were unfamiliar to me in my waking life um, that seemed so interesting. And I, I wondered how, you know, what, why is my brain cranking this stuff out every night? What's, there's gotta be a reason for this. Um, so as I said, I started writing in the 70s, but in 1983, I really started, um, being more consistent about writing dreams down um, and keeping those journals safe and in a place where I could find them. So um, that's sort of my start down this road. Um, and then as I started um, keeping those journals and um, keeping track of my dreams a little better, I realized that the more I was writing, the more I was remembering. Um, and so the act of writing them down became sort of a, a trigger for, it was like telling my brain, this is important stuff, you're writing it down, so we'll remember more of it for you. Um, and now I keep a bullet journal which I'm gonna talk about a little later instead of dedicated dream journals. But I'll show you, this is my bullet journal. And we'll talk a little more about that. And these are my original dream journals. So I just bought cheap composition books at Walmart and started writing everything down. I think you can see that. And you can see that I am a total nerd, and this is all highlighted in different colors. And I'll talk a little bit about that too. And here's another one that I haven't highlighted yet, so we'll talk about that too. Um, any questions so far? 
I'll blab, 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 but you interrupt me if you want. Um, okay, so a little bit about sleep, um, which I really find fascinating because, you know, we go to sleep and we wake up, but there's a whole lot happening while we're asleep. Um, people go through nightly five stages of sleep. Stages one and two are light sleep where it's pretty easy to wake somebody up. Stages three and four are deep, deep sleep where it's really hard to wake you up and you're really groggy if you wake up during this cycle. It's hard to shake it. Um, and stage five is called REM sleep or rapid eye movement sleep. Um, research has shown that we dream in all of those cycles, although we do most of our dreaming during REM sleep. Um, and chances are the dreams we experience during REM sleep are the ones we're going to remember. Um, REM sleep starts about 10 minutes. Um, those REM cycles, so we have these five stages of sleep, but we repeat those all night, these five stages. We just cycle through them. And our first REM cycle in the night is about 10 minutes and then they get progressively longer throughout the night. Um, science has also shown that we do most of our dreaming during that while we're dreaming we are producing theta waves in the brain and the more theta waves we produce the more REM cycles we have. So or the more REM cycles we have, the more theta waves. Anyway, theta waves are the important brain waves for dreaming. Um, let's see. OK, so it's really interesting that your muscles are paralyzed during REM sleep. Um, my mother, who lives with me, has some sort of glitch in that function. So she's not always paralyzed during REM sleep. And we see this in sleepwalkers um, and sometimes sleep talkers. So my mother has long conversations out loud in her sleep. And she moves her hands and does needlework with her hands when she's sleeping. So, so it's possible um, that in some people this function doesn't operate quite the same way. But most of us are paralyzed during REM sleep because you don't want to act out your dreams. I mean, if you're falling off a cliff, you know, if you're running down the middle of the street, you don't want to be doing that in your sleep. Um, I also find it really interesting that babies have so much REM sleep. You know, for babies, REM sleep occupies about 80% of their sleep in the night. That seems like a lot. So, and, and for adults, it's only about 20%. So what that tells me and what some researchers are now suggesting is that babies experience a lot of REM sleep because they're practicing things in their sleep that they have learned during the day. They're they're going over things in their sleep. Things like language and object identification and things like that. Um, the other thing that surprised me when I learned it is that during REM sleep, your brain is actually as active as it is when you're awake. <laughs> so it's not like your brain shuts off when you go to sleep. Your brain is still going to town. Um, and the prefrontal cortex of your brain becomes less active. That's the part of your brain that's responsible for rational thought, focused attention, um, decision making, um, analytical thinking. Those are all processed in the prefrontal cortex. That part of your brain, that rational, um, logical part of your brain kind of backs off during REM sleep. 
and the limbic system becomes more active. So the limbic system is kind of in the center of your brain and it's responsible for emotion and memory and instinctual actions. So, so this suggests to me that, um, that whatever's happening in dreams is, is somehow more um, primal or instinctual than the, than the waking brain. Um, it involves more just those gut feelings, intuition, emotions, insights, etc. Um, okay, so we have four to six REM cycles per night. So what that means is we have at least four to six dreams per night that we could be remembering. I mean, most people, um, most people maybe remember one, right? We just, we usually we remember the dream that happens in the last REM cycle before we wake up. And that's the one we remember. But there, but there are more dreams happening during the night. And you can actually train your brain, which is, which we'll talk about to remember more. Um, so I just thought this was a nice illustration of the two parts of your brain that work day and night. So the day shift is the prefrontal cortex and the night shift is the limbic brain. Um, so, and, and it says here, fight or flight, freeze, stress responses. Um, am I safe? Do people want me emotions um so you can see i think because it's the limbic system at work i think you can see why dreams can have such an emotional impact um even when the dream is over and you're waking up you know you can still feel those dreams sometimes um a couple other interesting things. The continuity hypothesis um, is a research theory that suggests that people dream what they know, essentially. So um, whatever you're concerned with or whatever happens to you or whatever you experience in your waking life, those are the things you're going to dream about. Um, and researchers say that's why dreams feel so real, because you're populating your dreams with very real stuff from your waking life. Um, this is also the way we dream about people we know, although um, the Freudian and Jungian dream theories always postulated that the people we dream about are really just representatives of ourselves. So Jung thought that a person you dreamed about represented some aspect of yourself. So if you dreamed about somebody who was um, very kind-hearted, for Jung that meant you were really kind-hearted and maybe not expressing that part of you, so it appears in your dream. Um, this is also, in my mind, why generic dream interpretation doesn't work. So, you know, you can get, you can get lots of books on dream interpretation. Um, I think there's probably apps for dream interpretation and services you can pay for where other people interpret your dreams. But for me, um, these will never work because it's such a personal language, the language of dreams. And because your brain is gonna populate your dreams and build your dreams out of what you know, not what out of not out of what a dream interpreter knows or a book. Does that make sense? Um 
Okay, for example, a dream about children crying might be about recovering the inner child for one person. But for me, if I dream about a child crying, it's because I had four kids and I heard a lot of kids crying. <laughs> so I'm just going to haul that stuff back out of my brain. Um, and that's, that's going to build the stories in my dreams. So... Um, okay, theories about dreams. Um, any questions? Anybody have a question or a comment so far? Okay, if you want to share stories about your own dreams too, I would strongly encourage you to do that too. Um, okay, so here are the main theories about why we dream. And first, I'm going to say nobody knows. Nobody really knows why we dream. Um, but the main theories, um, this, the study of dreams is called honorology. Um, it's, it's an actual scientific branch or study, field of study. Um, and most of, the, most of the theories that we're familiar with still go back to Freud and Sigmund Freud and Carl Jung. Most of what, what we know about dream theory comes from that. Um, and, and what Freud and Jung said was that dreams have a psychological function, that they're there to exercise your neural pathways, exercise your brain while you sleep, and um, that, you know, Freud, of course, famously thought that we express our subconscious and repressed emotions and longings and sexual desires in our dreams. So we kind of let loose the inner bad girl or bad boy or bad person um, in our dreams because we couldn't handle facing that as those aspects of ourselves in our waking life. Jung thought that the function of dreams was also psychological, um, but that they were meant to help us reflect on our waking lives and to work through problems. So if we couldn't face a problem in our waking life, we would try to deal with it and try to problem solve in our sleep. Um, Jung also thought that dreams were a sort of bridge between our conscious mind and our unconscious mind. He thought we didn't really have access to our unconscious minds except through dreams, that somehow they were like a little door that opened to our subconscious minds. Um, there also have been physical theories of dreams, um, and, and one of the most popular physical theories of dreams is that it's just random brain energy. So we're just blowing off electrical steam in our brains. Um, and that because we're human beings and we have this wild excess electrical energy floating around, we want to make it make sense. So we build stories around it. Um, but it's really the only point of it is to discharge this extra energy. Um, okay, but the newest dream research suggests that dreams really are all about memory and emotion. Um, that dreams are a way for our brains to process and remember events and experiences from our daily lives. So if you, if you think about it, you know, if something happens to me today, um, the only way I'm going to remember it two weeks from now is if it somehow gets from my short-term memory to my long-term memory. Short-term doesn't last very long. Things disappear. Your brain has to move things from short-term to long-term memory in order for you to remember them down the road. So researchers are now suggesting 
that this is the purpose of dreams. Dreams help us process our daily lives so that we can move things into our long-term memory. Um, part of this theory is that dreams let us work out in these pretend stories what might be too traumatic or confusing or um, or emotionally charged for us to deal with when we're awake. So in other words, dreaming about something that might be traumatic takes the edge off, according to this theory, slightly so that you can keep processing it and deal with it better in your waking life. Um, let's see. So again, these are all ways, according to these theories, that we, these stories we build in our dreams, according to these theories, are all ways that help us make meaning out of our daily lives, move our memories where they need to be, um, and process the things that happen to us. Research has also shown that dreams improve creativity and problem solving. So this is one reason I'm really interested in dreams because if there, you know, if dreams can inspire and increase creativity and help me better solve my problems, what a great thing that is. Um, so, and I should say that I have um, worked dreams, or dreams have worked themselves into my poetry, too. So, so I'm kind of behind this creativity and problem solving theory, um, maybe because I want to be, but that's all right. Stella, we have a question. Okay. The question is, do you think that taking a sleeping agent medication affects the ability to dream or recall dreams? Ooh, that's a very good question. And I would say, um, yes. Um, only because I think probably sleep aids, you're still going through those same sleep cycles. So you're still going through REM sleep cycles and still dreaming. Um, however, it, it might, sleep aids might make it harder for you to recall the dreams. So the dreams are still happening, but it might be a little tougher to recall them. Um, and and it, I suppose it depends on the sleep aid too, um, and how groggy you are when you wake up, things like that. But that's a great question. Um, and if you're taking prescription sleep aids, that would be a very good question for your doctor. I would ask about dreams. Thank you for that. Um, okay, so um, one thing I got interested in along the way is something that people call lucid dreaming. And lucid dreaming just means that you're aware you're dreaming. So you're having a dream, but you know you're dreaming. Or you're having a dream, but you're watching yourself in the dream, dream. Does that make sense? <laughs> it's a crazy layer of sleep, I think. Um, sometimes we call it metacognition, where you think about how you think or um, meta anything, you know, meta writing novel, a meta novel is a novel about writing a novel. So anytime something circles back on itself. Um, I know that there are lots, loads of websites that are dedicated to lucid dreaming. Um, I, and, and I've had many, I guess, many lucid dreams myself, but they don't, you know, it doesn't strike me that they're 
extraordinary or that you have more insight, you know, it doesn't strike me as something that you maybe want to work for um, or that you need to work for, I guess is a better way to say it. I don't, don't think those lucid dreams are any more productive or insightful than any other kind of dream. But, but I know that some people are very interested in that aspect of dreaming. Um, and then I learned recently that that feeling of falling off a cliff, which we've all had, is called a hypnic jerk. Um, and, and scientists believe that it's a reaction to a sudden muscle movement. So, you know, for instance, if you, if you have a leg cramp, you might dream that you're falling off a cliff and that wakes you up. So you can deal with the cramp. Or if your arm falls asleep because you have it thrown over your head um, and you get those tingles, you might have that hypnic jerk. Um, it can, I'm sure you all know that it can feel extremely real. <laughs> um, and, and scientists also think it might be caused by stress and or caffeine consumption. That's probably my problem. Um, or anxiety or extreme muscle tension. So they aren't dangerous. Um, I have seen no research that suggests if you die in your dream, you'll die in your waking life. You know, I mean, there are kind of lots of, there's lots of mythology surrounding dreams too. Um, dreams of flying. Um, the best research says that that dream of flying has to do with euphoria that you usually experience those flying dreams when you're feeling really good about something or when you're really happy about something or when you're really relieved so you just feel lighter emotionally and your brain interprets that as flying which i think is great um and then last, I'm not going to belabor this too long, but last I want to just say something about prophetic dreams. Um, I think there's a really fine line between prophetic and um, insightful. So let me say that. Um, I think prophetic dreams for most people are pretty rare. I'll say I have had a couple. Um, and um, I'll give you one example. Um, I had a dream about a minister friend of mine. And I dreamed that he was behind his desk and things were piling up on his desk. And they just kept appearing in these piles until I could no longer see him. And I felt um, this overwhelming sense of sadness and confusion, um, like he had gone somewhere, like he had, he left while, while my vision was blocked. And so I emailed him within the week, I think right away and just said, you know, is something going on? Are you all right? I just had this weird dream and here's what happened in the dream. And, um, and he said, no, no, I'm fine. Everything's good. And, and so I forgot about it. And then about six months later, he emailed me and said, you know, back when you had that dream, I was trying to decide whether or not to leave the priesthood. Um, and so, you know, I, Part of me, I mean, the romantic in me wants to think, oh, I saw it, <laughs> it was visionary. <laughs> you know, I had this prophetic dream, but the other part of me thought, we had been friends for so long and I knew him well, and maybe I just had this insight that things were not right and my brain took over and gave me this story 
um, so that I could voice my concern about him. So, you know, so I think they're very, go ahead. We have another question. Um, right. Someone said, can you talk about recurring dreams? <gasps> that is a, that is a great question. Um, I can only talk about, I, I have not seen any research that presents theories on recurring dreams. I can only talk about my own experience. Uh, and I have had a couple dreams that repeated. Um, and my theory is that your, your brain is giving, is presenting you with this story to help you solve a problem. So if you ignore that, your brain is going to find a way to present that again so that you will solve that problem. And if you ignore that, your brain is going to say, here it is again. You know, I'm trying to tell you something. It, it, in my theory, it's just yourself repeating something you want to learn or a point you need to get. Um, and really that's what all dreams are is you talking to yourself, right? It's not somebody from outside talking to you. So, um, and usually the, the dreams I can think of that repeat, like I had a recurring dream where I was in a church and the church was of course like a maze because, you know, all buildings are like mazes in your dreams. But I was in this church and I kept going up the stairs, down the stairs. Um, I couldn't find the way out of this church. I was knocking on doors. Um, I was calling for help. I couldn't get outside. And then um, after about, after I'd had the dream about three or four times, I think, the last time I had it, a voice spoke to me and said, you have to cry and then the doors will open. So, um, so for me, that meant you have to acknowledge that this is going to be an emotionally painful thing. Um, and then you can go out. So, um, does that, I hope that answers your question. Yeah. No. Thumbs up. <laughs> I, yep, I think you must have answered it. <laughs> okay, great, great. Um, okay, so the last thing I'll say about prophetic dreams is that I, I have had one dream. I mean, I'm 64 years old. I've had one dream since 1983 that I consider prophetic. And that's because it was a dream about somebody I didn't know. I saw a person's name and um, I saw the person's name and I had a dream that I was in a camp and a man came to me and said, you have to go tell him, don't go to the north. Um, and so when I woke up, I thought that that's just the most bizarre thing ever. Um, and I started Googling this man's name and found out that he was a university professor, um, who I didn't know. And, um, and I decided, <laughs> okay, I, I'm going to take the plunge. I asked to meet with them. And I uh, went to his office and met with him and explained the dream. And I said, I don't, I don't know what this means. It might mean I shouldn't have had a burrito before I went to bed. Um, but I'm giving it to you to do with what you want. And, um, and it turned out he was planning a trip to North Dakota. Um, and the trip involved horses. And um, I can't remember now, something had happened. I think the horses broke down a corral panel or something and got out. Anyway, that's the only dream I've ever had um, that 
didn't seem to have anything to do with my own life. And I'm only telling you that because I felt a responsibility to tell him. Uh, I, I, can't, um, I can't quite um, express how necessary I thought it was to tell him. Um, and so, you know, I, I think it is possible. And again, maybe it was just insight. Maybe I had heard his name in a radio broadcast or, you know, in a passing conversation. We're not always aware of what we hear. So. Marcella, I have one more question here. Uh, and this is, this is one I'm curious about too. I've had this happen. Any thoughts on dreaming about people you know who have passed away either recently or way in the past? Um, well, I, I've had that happen. Uh, I remember after my grandmother died, I had a dream, and, and it was maybe three or four months after she died, I had a dream about her where she drove up in a convertible and she seemed to be about 30 and she was having a blast and um and we had a nice chat and she drove on um and i uh, i honestly think for me it was a way for me to tell myself it's okay you know things are okay she's okay i'm okay too um, so in, in a way, I think it's, um, it's just a way to make sense of death, which is, you know, of course, the big question that we don't have answers to. So it, it's a way for us to process that uncertainty of death. Um, I, I personally believe that, um, and I probably shouldn't even say this, <laughs> but I personally believe that death is not an end because energy can't die and human beings are made up of energy. So in my mind, it is, there is a possibility that people who move on um, can find a way to communicate with the living. I don't know that for sure. But, but I feel like if that was a possibility, dreams would be a wonderful way to communicate. And also because as Jung said, it's the bridge between the conscious mind and the subconscious mind. And we don't know what the subconscious mind is capable of. Maybe connecting with our dead friends and family. You know, we just don't know. So. Does that help or not at all? <laughs> um, let's see. Okay, so dream journals. Here's what Young said. Dreams are the guiding words of the soul. Why should I henceforth not love my dreams and not make their riddling images into objects of my daily consideration? Young was totally obsessed with dreams and the possibility that dreams presented. Um, and I'm probably not far behind him in my fascination. <laughs> um, so some reasons, why, why should you keep a dream journal? I mean, it's another thing you gotta do every day. So, you know, do we really need another job every day? I don't know. Marcella, can I interrupt you for just one second? We have a you question bet. that relates to just before this slide. Um, oh, the question says, many of the people in my dreams are in their 30s. Is this common with other people? Maybe if people want to write um, in the group chat, um, in the chat on the side, yes, no, sure, you know, that would be really, that would be really interesting. Yeah, uh, that certainly seems to be the case for me. <clears throat> Plus, you know, my dreams about people who have been um, injured or killed or ill in my waking life, um, in my dreaming life, they're fine. 
you know, they're healed and whole and um, vibrant in my sleeping life, dreaming life. So I want to look at the chat. What's everybody say? Unmute. There we go. They're saying all ages in my dreams, not in my 30s. And then someone said, well, now that I think about it, most of my subjects are younger. I haven't thought about it before, personally. Isn't that weird? All ages for me as well. Yeah, lots of different answers. Mm -hmm. Mostly older. Interesting. That's a really yeah. cool question. It is a good question. And it also, I think, points out again this idea that dreams are a personal language because, you know, people who see everybody as older, there's probably some reason you need to see people as older and, and the same with younger people. So, um, so the Chicago School of Poetics, which I find really interesting, offers an entire semester class on dreams and poetry. Um, as a poet myself, this makes perfect sense to me because dream language and imagery is so much like poetic imagery. Um, and what they say is what Samuel Taylor Coleridge called the ego nocturnus or the night self is a prime source of poetry if you know how to map it. And I would say that it's also a prime source of art and music and um, self-study and other things if you know how to map it. And for me, poetry journals are the way to map it. So, um, and, and this is maybe the most important idea for me about dreams. And also I think the foundation of Jung's theories is that dreams offer you a way into your mind that's unfiltered by your little daily waking editors. You know, we are so busy editing everything we say, everything we do, the information we take in, we're picking and choosing what we want to remember and what we don't want to remember in our waking lives. But in our dreaming lives, that little editor goes to sleep. So everything is unfiltered and um, there's, it seems so much more rich to me um, sometimes than the waking life where I try to clean everything up, if that makes sense. Um, okay, so an, more reasons to keep a dream journal. A healthy imagination is vital to making sense of your world. You know, if we couldn't imagine, we wouldn't be able to plan for the future. Um, if we couldn't imagine, we wouldn't be able to jerry-rig things. You know, we use our imaginations all the time. And anything that exercises that imagination seems important to me. And dreams do that. Um, also, I think dreams can be very important, especially for people who live with trauma, um, people who live in abusive situations, people who live in um, dire circumstances. Dreams can be a, a source of relief and they can also be a way to help process that pain and trauma. Um, they can also be a way for you to see solutions that the immediate pain of trauma doesn't let you see in your waking life. So I think they can be extremely important for that. Um, let's see. Also, I think we can see, experience happiness in our dreams and then figure out ways to reproduce that in our waking lives. Um, and that's especially important right now 
when there's so much conflict around us. So, um, and really dreams can just help you understand yourself better, which I think is the goal of life on earth. <laughs> I think, uh, you know, one of my purposes on this planet is to learn to understand myself. You know, we're all asking those questions. Why am I here? What's my purpose? Where do we go? Um, and dreams help me look at myself and figure out my place in the world. So, um, okay. So the actual journals, <laughs> this is the fun part. So um, one thing I, I tell people is always keep a keep your journal and a pen by your bed. And I'm going to show you my groovy pen I found on Amazon. I don't know if you can see this. Can you see that? Okay, so it lights up. Ah, so I can, if I wake up during the night, and I remember a dream, I can quickly write it down without the interruption, the big blast of turning lights on, without waking my husband up so he starts talking to me. You know, I can just surreptitiously write it down really quick. Even if you just do bullet points when you wake up and remember a dream, you can always go back and fill it in later. Get the highlights as soon as you possibly can. The sooner you write your dreams down, the better you'll remember them. Um, so likewise, if you wake up during the night and you remember something, write it down before you go back to sleep. If you say to yourself, I'm going to go back to sleep and I'll write it down in the morning, it's gone. So you got to write them down as soon as you possibly can. Another thing I tell people is don't use a clock radio that wakes you up with NPR, which, which is what we like. Um, but the problem with that is if you wake up to voices talking, you're human, so you're going to listen to those voices. And while you're listening to those voices, your dreams are just floating away. Um, also, my husband knows he cannot talk to me in the morning until I say he can, <laughs> because if I remember a dream when I wake up, I want to write that baby down before anybody speaks to me. So the less outside stimuli you have coming in before you write, I'm, before you write your dreams down, the more you'll forget. So. Um, yeah, right as soon as you can before you get out of bed, before you go to the bathroom, before you talk to anybody. Um, researchers say we forget as much as 95% of our dreams within five minutes of waking up. So, um, and the other thing I'll say is that um, if you get up right away and write your dreams down uh, before you do anything else, you may, in the process of writing your dream down, remember two or three other dreams you had the same night. So it can kind of trick your brain into saying, oh, I guess we need this stuff. So um, write down all the details you can remember, even if you can't make sense of the dream. You don't have to write it down like a story. You just have to write it down like a witness. So just write down what you see. And if you want to, you can write down how you feel. Um, I always date entries. Let me just pull one of these out here. So I'll show you this page here. So the entries are dated. Can, can you kind of see that? I know it's not huge, but um, the entries are all dated in the margin over here. And then, um, I'll find a page. And then sometimes you'll see I make notes in the margins too, um, which I'll talk about in a minute. 
Um, you can write a line or two after each entry just to log your responses or your emotions, you know, like wake up, woke up feeling miserable, woke up feeling joyful, you know, if you want to just give that emotional impression. Um, or the other thing I do is, um, and let me see if I can find one of these. The other thing I do is if I wake up and I remember a dream and I write it down. Um, okay, so here's an example. I don't know if you can see this, but there's some blue highlighting right here. Can you see that? So if I wake up and I remember a dream and I know exactly what the dream is the result of you know so my example is if you have a flat tire and that night you dream you're stuck in the middle of nowhere that connection is pretty obvious so what i'll do is at the end of my log i'll just in parentheses and then i highlight it in blue i'll write note i had a flat tire today if i if i made the connection myself i'll write that down and then sometimes I also, I wonder if I've done it here. Sometimes I'll draw pictures. Like I remember having a dream once where I was in the desert and I was coming to a fence and I looked up and there were three lights in the sky and they came together to make a triangle. And I thought, UFOs. <laughs> so, um, so I drew that scene. I drew the little fence and I drew the three dots so that I could remember kind of how that looked. And, and I like to do that fairly often, illustrate my dreams. Although I am so not an artist, they really are like stick figure drawings. Um, okay, so this is this is really important in terms of dream journaling. You're training your brain. It's like any kind of exercise. The more you do it, the better you get. So I have remembered up to six dreams in one night. That that is so rare, but I I almost always remember at least three. And so um let me see if I have that in here. So if you look here, like this says one, two, and three, and the one, two, and three are highlighted in pink. Can you see that? Yeah, so that's three different dreams in one night. So I'll kind of separate them. And and again, it's like telling your limbic system okay this stuff matters so you hang on to it till i write it down you're you're just training your brain um okay so now you're keeping a dream journal you're writing all this stuff down um now what do you do with it <laughs> you know it is it is all you need to do, write it down. And, um, and for me, the answer is no, I have to do something more with it. Um, because I, I need to have a purpose for things. So, um, so one thing I tell people is, you've written all this stuff down. I mean, wait till you have a little bit to work with, but then go back and start rereading your dreams. And I am a total dork, so I like to highlight everything, um, which is why I can't check out books from the library, I have to buy books. Um, and I like to highlight in different colors. Um, so when I, um, so what I do is, like you can see, here is green and orange. The green highlighting is just interesting kind of things that that were in the dream, like baby, newborn, bookshop, library, troll doll, band. 
Um, and then the orange is all the people who appear in the dreams. So um, Valerie Smith, Grandma, Mom, Ron Thaden, who I haven't seen for 20 years, Al Biella. Um, so um, I highlight significant details. I color code them because I'm a dork and because it helps me go back and find things fast. The other thing about highlighting is if I highlight in one color all the kind of things that appear in the dreams, like baby, pretty soon I'm going to see that babies show up a lot in my dreams. You're going to start to see the things that your brain is going to keep throwing in your face, the things that are really important to you for one reason or another. So um, I'm because I'm a literature teacher, I always think of William Faulkner, who's um, my favorite American author, really, even though he's kind of a crazy guy. Um, I always think of his stories, his short stories and novels, because there are clocks and timepieces in all his work. So it, it'll be a broken clock, a clock ticking somewhere where no one can see, a mantle clock, um, a stopwatch. You know, his stories are so full of timepieces. And my theory, he never talked about it, but my theory is that he was really obsessed with the idea of the dying south and the encroaching north, time passing on the old, old aristocratic south. So I look at my dream journals and I see, oh man, you dream about babies a lot. What's up with that? And I realize, you know, I'm just an obsessive parent. Um, I, you know, my kids are in their 30s and 40s now and I'm still pretty hardcore parenting, <laughs> probably more than I should. And now I have grandkids, so, you know more babies. There's never an end to the babies in my dreams. <laughs> and you'll start to see those kinds of patterns, you know, maybe you'll see, um, I don't know, maybe you'll see flowers recur often in your dreams. Those repeating images in your dreams probably mean something to you, and you can start to examine that if you highlight um, another thing I pay close attention to is things that seem very symbolic, like names, numbers, signs. Um, I remember I had a dream once where I was, and I'm not particularly a religious person, but I had a dream that I was walking, holding hands with God, as one does. <laughs> I guess. And, um, and we walked up and there was a big, like archway. And at the top of the archway, there was a sign that said, less and fonts. Less and fonts. Um, and I had to, when I woke up, I had to look that up because I had no idea what it meant. But again, it's the baby thing coming back, you know. Um, so signs, colors, shapes, foreign languages, dates, those can all be really important to you. Um, let's see. I have had dreams where I dreamed um, places or names that at least in my waking life I wasn't familiar with. Maybe in my subconscious I was but then I'd have to go look them up later. So I always try to write down anything that seems particular that I don't necessarily know. Um, okay, so dream resources, we talked a little bit about that and they can be fun, but I really think you, you're the only person who can crack your own code. You know, your brain is, is, creating those dreams out of stuff only you know and feel. 
and think. So um, the more you interact with your dreams, the more you write them down, write margin notes, highlight, the more specific they seem to get. So I don't know if you're if it's a way of signaling your brain that this matters. And so your brain kind of feeds you more of what you want from dreams. Uh, I'm not sure why that is, but they get more specific. Um, sometimes if I've had a particularly colorful dream and write that down, some people say they only dream in black and white. I think that's fine if you're one of those people. I dream in color and sometimes the colors are really crazy and bright um, and I write that down and think about the colors. Sometimes I'll use highlighters to make the colors and then it seems like the next night I'll have even more colorful dreams. So it's kind of like you're encouraging yourself to flip that switch in your brain. Um, okay, let's see. Okay, so bullet journals. This is my bullet journal. Um, and I started, you know, I gave up the composition books and started doing the bullet journal. A bullet journal is just a journal where you have everything. So, you know, I have calendars in here. I write my dreams down. I have a meditation log in there. I used to keep all these journals, you know, I'd have a daily journal where I just wrote down what happened today. Um, when my grandmother died, I got all her journals. And I'll tell you, that was amazing to read those journals. You know, she would write down what the weather was like that day, how much she spent on groceries. Um, it was an amazing history of her life. She also wrote deeply personal things. And really, I didn't know of my grandmother's humanity until I read those journals. Um, and so I was doing the same thing, keeping a daily journal. I had my dream journal. Then I started keeping a gratitude journal. Um, once I knew that keeping gratitude journals actually can change your brain physically and make you more positive. I started keeping a gratitude journal. Then I had a calendar. Then I had to-do lists. <laughs> so now I just have everything in the bullet journal. So I have these little tabs for sections. One's the calendar. One's the dreams. So, and I just carry it everywhere. Um, this is an example of a bullet journal. Um, so Carl Jung said the dream is the small hidden door in the deepest and most intimate sanctum of the soul. Jung believed in something called the basement, which is the place where we stuff everything we don't want to deal with, right? All our, all our emotional baggage, our trauma, our confusion, anything you can't quite deal with, you stuff in there. And he also believed that dreams were the door, that you could open that door through dreams. So, um, and I love this quote from Ann Sexton, in a dream you are never 80. <laughs> and, and maybe that's the point of our earlier discussion where we see everybody as younger, because because really on the inside, I'm 20, you know, I, I'm still as engaged and interested as I was when I was 20. It's just this body that's 64, so. Um, and I like this one too. I do not know whether I was then a man dreaming I was a butterfly or whether I am now a butterfly dreaming I am a man. Um, yep. Okay, so this is the fun part. <clears throat> so what I want everybody to do is, I'm gonna end this PowerPoint so I can see your happy faces. Let me see, how do I get back to this? Hold on one second. 
Okay. Oh, I have to quit sharing. Okay, hi there. Um, okay, so what I'd like you to do is write down one dream you can remember, good or bad. Um, write down all the details you can remember, um, especially things like colors, um, weather, time of day, um, people or places where you might be at in the dream. Um, and then we'll talk, we'll see if anybody wants to share and we'll talk about those. Um, okay, so, so maybe 10 minutes, does that sound workable? I'm going to write too, so. <clears throat> Set a timer, so I'll let you know when 10 minutes is over. Oh, perfect. Okay. I have to have coffee when I'm dream journaling.
Is everybody just about done? Maybe a thumbs up if you're done. Great. All right. Um, okay, so I had a boring dream. I remembered this is last night's dream. I dreamed my friend was at giving a concert, was going to do a concert. I, I know a lot of musicians, and so he was going to have a concert. And I was really sad that I wasn't part of the concert. But he had a clipboard with a checklist and he was checking off my name as somebody who might be involved in the next concert, which of course didn't make me much happier, but there you go. So I highlighted his name and I highlighted the word concert because bands and concerts come up a lot in my dreams. Um, and I highlighted the word checklist. So I don't know what checklist has to do with anything. Okay, so does anybody feel like sharing? Raise your hand. Okay, how about oh, yeah, Cheryl? Yeah. Okay. Hi. Um, I, I too noticed that the more I wrote, the more I remembered. But the first one I wrote was a recurring dream that I have about it being the last day of vacation. That's always the basis of the recurring dream. The okay. place is different, but it's always the final day. And it's... I'm always, the, the, the word I circle is overwhelmed because I'm always feeling this pressure to get, we're in a condo and I've got to clean it up and I've got to pack everything up and get out of there before checkout time. And checkout time comes and goes and I miss the deadline and I knew I would, there was too much to do. And that's sort of it. Wow. So do you, so my, my curiosity is, do you have a job or did you have a job that was deadline driven? That's exactly the conclusion I've come to is I, um, I just retired about four years ago uh -huh. and I've had the, the dream has become very recurring since retirement. Oh. It's connected so. somehow to retirement or to the end of, you know, like the end of a stage of my life or something. Right. Right. And can I ask what you did for a living? <laughs> I was in a very high pressure job. I worked in dentistry. Oh my gosh. So yeah, it might, maybe it's just your brain's way of um, keeping one foot in that door that you're so familiar with. But yeah. Interesting. Yeah, and, and do you feel as frantic in the dream as you did in your working life? Do you think? Yes, there, that pressure to stay on schedule, to stay on task. There's always the next person waiting, and I have to stay, you know, in that time schedule. Interestingly, I just realized I don't believe I've had this dream since lockdown. Oh. Since COVID. So I'm not sure what that association is. Well, maybe just because, you know, the if there's a benefit of of isolation and quarantine it's that we we have more time you know and so maybe your body is unwinding from all that stress oh yeah very thanks interesting yeah that yeah thanks for sharing that did you notice any colors or smells or sounds not that i can recall just the feeling of being overwhelmed is the biggest impression. Right. Great. Thanks for sharing that. Thank you. Who else wants to share? I love it. I can do it all day. Carolyn. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Okay, good. Yeah, but this is kind of, well, like all dreams, sometimes you're silly and sometimes you, you've been mm -hmm. thinking about somebody and part of them or I, I, an episode in your life where they were involved comes back into this is uh, mine was a couple of nights ago and I couldn't it was a, it was about uh, I had this beautiful red red Cadillac oh nice and, and I was driving some people at, um, to um, to an event and uh, the 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 red Cadillac uh, represents to me one of the women I know in the condo community I'm in and um, and the people in the back seat were some of the people 
some of the, her friends on the street that she lives on. So they were, we were all going somewhere. And in the past we have, I have picked them up and taken them to a movie together. But, um, and uh, so, it, and so we'd gone somewhere and left, I left the car somewhere and I don't know how all these people walk where we all went, but uh, I left the car and um, I was making arrangements with my son to go pick the car up. And these women were all telling me where my car was. <laughs> and it was all in various places. And I said, no, you're wrong. It's, it's down here and it's down to the, the, the street down here, two blocks down in the south. And no, no, they were, all, they were telling me where to go. Um, anyway, um, it, the place that we were, and I, I, you know, not a lot of detail here, but we were, we were in a building like an old school house on the second floor. And I was looking out the window to see if the car had, if my son had, had driven the car up to the building yet, so I could have all these folks go back down and get in the car. So um, that's that's kind of about it. Um, I, I don't know at that point where we're all going. Maybe we're all going to a movie. But I recently had been thinking about these folks because I I'm, I'm not where they are right now, and I'm I kind of miss them. And recently mm -hmm. I had talked to one of them, and she her husband had passed away. Um, a few weeks before that. So, um, you know, just kind of thinking about those folks. Mm -hmm. well, but the red, I, the red Cadillac was beautiful. And in, in the past, I had a red Camaro. Oh, nice. A beautiful, a beautiful red Camaro. And it was stolen. Nice. <laughs> so, anyway. yeah, I would definitely highlight that color. Yeah. That color's pretty pronounced. And the other thing your dream reminded me about is that sometimes you'll you'll have one dream so your red cadillac and all these friends and then you'll maybe have a second dream this is a whole different rem cycle where you're in the on the second floor of an old schoolhouse um but you pull in components of the first dream you connect yeah. those yeah. so um i have had experiences where you know i'll have three different dreams and then i just somehow i make a gateway between those dreams that makes absolutely no sense at all usually you know like mm -hmm. all of a sudden you're on you've teleported to the second story of an old school house yeah yes. so very interesting and mm -hmm. the, what, I, boy, also uh, i want to say i i was i had my my dream uh folder here Mm -hmm. And I'm looking at the first one I wrote, and it was back in 2010. Nice. Well, I guess for 10 years, I've been kind of waking up in the morning and jotting down this stuff. Oh, you have a lot of good material to work with. And then sometimes I say in my dream, this is just a dream. Yeah, I, I've had that happen too. Or <laughs> I just kind of look at myself, my dream, in the dream and go this is a bizarre dream <laughs> i'm not gonna buy this one no good yeah, yeah. right right um who thank else you. yeah thank you for sharing oh okay anyone oh, oh linda weber yeah linda weber i have to unmute you okay um, well, I wrote about a prophetic dream from 47 years ago. Oh my God! And, and it's still it's because of the what happened. Uh, it it just has stuck with me. But um, I was in college. I was home for Christmas vacation, and um, a friend of mine who was also in college was home for Christmas vacation. Well, I dreamed that she called me and said, all excited, Linda, I can't believe you won't believe what happened. She said. I'm married. I'm get. I got engaged. I'm going to marry Bob. And I said, no, wait, you mean you're going to marry John? Cause she'd been dating John and I knew a Bob, but he was a jerk and she would never marry Bob. And, um, she said, no, no, I'm marrying Bob. And I said, well, what about John? I don't care about him. I love Bob. I'm marrying Bob. And, um, you know, <laughs> I woke up and I was, um, you know, upset or anxious or something. In fact, I told three people of that dream because it was so unusual. You, you wouldn't believe how weird this dream was. And about 10 o'clock in the morning, she called me and she said, Linda, you won't believe what happened. 
I got engaged last night to Bob. And I, I mean, I was just shocked. And I said, no, you mean, I, same thing as my dream. You mean John? No, no, Bob. And he was in the military and he had called her and they talked all night and he asked her repeatedly to marry him. And finally she said, yes. And um, wow. so I, I figure that, you know, if I could, clock the exact time I had that dream it might have been about the same time you know like four in the morning when she did say yes really strange but um you know very prophetic but why how that happened I don't understand but mm -hmm. as I was journaling here um the the words that I highlighted were she was so excited and giggling. Of course, she was a giggly person, but just, you know, like, this is just the most normal thing. Guess what happened to me? And then I wrote, I was upset and anxious. I thought she was crazy. Um, uh, there was confusion. Uh, it was unbelievable. And through doing this exercise, it not only brought up that dream, but it made me realize that I, I'm kind of a, a thinking, feeling type person. I'm not one to notice colors or shapes or that sort of thing. I'm not in life. I mean, I could leave your house and not tell you what color your living room was, you know, what clothes you're wearing. I, I don't notice details about physical mm -hmm. things. It's more mm -hmm. feelings that I get and things like that. And, uh, and when I think about a lot of my dreams, their, their feelings, I wake up anxious or happy or sad or whatever. It, it's occasionally I'll remember a color or something, but when I think about that dream, I even dismiss the color. Oh yeah, there was something red in there, but it's wow. like that was, that didn't stick out to me. It's not important. Well, That's my story. Uh, I had a couple of thoughts as you were talking. Um, first of all, the, the act of writing down your dreams and paying attention to details um, might make you pay attention to details more in your waking life, too. Like, you might notice things a little more in your waking life, too. And my other question is, so how did that marriage turn out? Divorce. <laughs> He he had some uh, was was Bob a good husband? No, no, he was not. He actually um, they they realized he was manic depressive. They did have a couple oh. children, but uh, divorce happened in less than five years, and uh, it was kind of like everybody knew it except her. You know that he wasn't a good choice, but whatever. Right. Oh, that's too bad. Yeah. But I do feel sorry for John because. They'd kind of been dating for years. Right. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. And, and dreams like that always make me wonder, you know, do, do we have, uh, do we somehow have a connection with other people that's beyond sort of physical connection? So it, were you connected to her in some way that allowed you to kind of feel this emotional energy as it happened you know well her, I think right. we were we were good friends and you know she told me I mean for years I heard you know John 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 and I and I knew she I liked him real well and you know I, I guess when I think about it I'm not sure that that would have been a good marriage choice either but you know right. um they're, they had a lot in common and a lot of connections and and you know she confided in me a lot so it wasn't unusual that she would call me and tell me you know I'd be one of the right. first people to know but yeah oh I think it's just so wonderful that you remember this still it's great yeah yeah well thanks for sharing I think we have a couple others um Jenna were you interested in sharing yeah um raise your hand. I do and then, Yep, and then um, I think Carol Slater, maybe? No, okay, okay. Yes, Go ahead, Jenna. Rose. Hi. Go Hi. ahead, Jenna. We're taking this together. So this is Rose that's in front of the screen. Oh, hi, Rose. Hey. Okay, uh, Rose is really into dreaming. Oh, wonderful. 
Oh, well, I'm having a like a like a breakfast, being in a hotel, mm -hmm. uh, enjoying the enjoying the view, and walking at the beach, ha having breakfast in bed with my friend, mm -hmm. and um, then we walk with a golden retriever. On oh, the nice! And and then we get to sit there talking for a while, get near to the waterfall, and then we come back home and have a spread of strawberries and chocolate. Wow. And we had, it's like, um, it's, it's like a honeymoon. Oh, very nice. So it was a beautiful dream, but I've been having the same thing um, for two weeks. It's like, the same dream. So do, is that something that's been on your mind lately? This yeah. idea of go, vacation or going to the beach? Yeah, and she had beautiful black hair. Oh, nice. So, and yeah. the golden retriever, do you have a golden retriever? No, I have a German Shepherd, but oh. um, I always wanted a golden retriever because they're very smart and they, um, they're very graceful. They're they're really friendly dogs too. They're really people dogs, and they also wake you up because they like to turn on the shower for you. <laughs> oh, nice! <laughs> That's a pretty smart dog. So Rose often adds to her dreams after she wakes up. Oh, nice! She takes the content from a dream and embellishes it. Really well, you know, there's a whole um, genre of creative writing called creative nonfiction, where you start with a nugget of truth, like the things that actually happened in the dream, and then you turn those into a work of fiction by adding all the same fi fictional elements that other writers use. She's a trendsetter. Yes, she's a trendsetter, exactly. <laughs> exactly yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you, Rose. You made me I hungry for strawberries and chocolate. I dream about a business I used to own. Oh, yeah? I didn't think that I dreamed last night, but apparently I did. Um, and we had to close that business 21 years ago. Wow. So trippy to me that in some alternate universe it still exists. And I dive in and out and I'll find somebody's running it for me. I'm often concerned because I haven't bought jewelry for it for a long time. And, you know, or when I place orders for jewelry, it never comes. It's, it's, um, it's interesting. Do you think, do you think that you're still maybe emotionally connected to that business, even though the business is physically gone? Oh yeah, it was a huge loss. Yeah. Yeah. So I'd say you're still processing that loss. I bet I'm going to be doing this until I die. Yeah, it I don't do it as well often be. as I used to, but I'm in and out of that store all the time. Right. Yeah. yeah. It was my favorite stuff. Oh. I, I used to go down to the basement and do my own retail. Oh, nice. <laughs> Was it a jewelry store? It was a um, women's specialty store, but jewelry was my strongest thing. Uh -huh. And I wonder if it's because the um, the widow of the guy I used to buy silver and turquoise from was here a week ago. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I dream about it, whether sh there's any immediate context or not. Yeah, it sounds like, a you know, your life is just keeping you connected to that yeah hey thanks thank you very much anybody else want to share oh, you'll have to take yourself off mute victoria she's in turkey it might be hard <laughs> actually that's russia oh, oh. russia <laughs> um well, a little history, I do travel a lot, but, um, th and this is 
a version of this recurring dream that I have. I'm in a beautiful city and I need to get home. And I get on some form of public transportation in this particular dream, it was a train. And I watch this beautiful skyline go by and it's just beautiful, different kinds of buildings and they morph from um, modern buildings to historic buildings. But I realize that I'm getting farther from home than um, I, I had planned. I thought this train I was gonna get, get on was gonna take me home, but instead it's taking me farther, farther away. Finally, I get, and I'm, I'm thinking, based on what you said, Marian, that these might be two dreams that I have that I, my brain has put together. Oh, because yeah. finally I get to a place where I can get off and it's dirty and dingy and ugly and a maze. And I have to call my father to come get me. I'm not quite sure where I am, but I need to call my dad who's long past. Um, but my phone doesn't work. Wow. So uh, I think I go from this happy, happy, what I love to something that I guess I need to deal with. Yeah, yeah. Well, and th I think that's the whole idea that you're either lost or disconnected or you need help that you can't find. That seems to be pretty common in dreams. I think. Okay. Yeah. And uh, I, I'm not sure what to make of it, except that you're probably processing something or trying to figure something out. Um, and maybe, you know, like if that were my dream, I would think, okay, I need help for this. Because the idea that you're trying to call somebody at the end and the phone doesn't work, you know, suggests to me that you're maybe looking for help dealing with something and not finding it. Although, I don't know. That actually, that does make some sense. And that I, um, I'm glad I worked through this because it, it made me perhaps think more about what, what I'm trying to deal with. Right, right. Yeah, we're, we're so busy most of us all the time that we we don't give ourselves permission to be self-aware or the time we need to be self-aware so for me i i'm i'm busy all the time so dreams are like the one time i can take a pause and talk to myself <laughs> so yeah nice thank you <laughs> i like the train part because Moving in dreams is always pretty interesting, too. And the fact that you're watching, I'll bet you didn't know where you were specifically, did you? No, I didn't. And, and throughout the various iterations of the dream, I'm in, I know I'm in cities that I've never seen before. Right. So probably your brain has just taken all your traveling and yeah. crammed it into one ball of travel. <laughs> Yeah. Interesting. And that part of the dream is really fun. Right. So there's that, yeah, that transition from fun to lost or confused. Frustration. Or, yeah. Frustration is really interesting. So, yeah. Okay. Who else? I love this. <laughs> Thea, did you write one down? I drew a picture, but you're going to think I'm a crazy person <laughs> because mine was, mine was a nightmare. <laughs> oh, um, wow. but it didn't, we all have those. It doesn't feel like a nightmare. Like I wasn't scared or it didn't wake up screaming. It just felt like something I was watching, but this is really strange. Okay. So <laughs> I dreamed that, that I go to my grandma's house and her house is on fire. And she comes out the front door and she's standing on the steps and she's nice and calm, but she doesn't have any skin. She's just made of sticks, sticks. and sticks. Yeah. And the sticks are like, kind of like um, the scarecrow in, you know, Dorothy in the Wizard of Oz. 
Um, but instead of hay, it's sticks. And the sticks, I can remember they were brown and they were kind of interwoven like a nest is. And she wasn't unhappy. She just walked out of her house and, and was made of sticks and her house was on fire. <laughs> but um, that, there's never been a house fire. My grandma's long gone. She didn't die in a fire. I mean, I, I don't know what it was, but it, it sticks with me. Yeah. It sticks with me big time. Yeah, that's really, it, it's so interesting that that the house is on fire and she's made of sticks, something extremely oh. flammable. <laughs> right, that is true. She walks yeah. and she's happy. <laughs> yeah, yeah so. she wasn't unhappy. She just like walked out like she usually does. And I was standing on the sidewalk and I'm like, Grandma, you know, <laughs> and she's like, hi. <laughs> yeah, so maybe your worry about your grandma is needless because she's, doing fine even though she's completely flammable. I hope she's not in a flaming place. She should be in a better place than that. Right, right, right. <laughs> Interesting. I like that you drew it too. I think yeah, you there just do a wasn't whole... a way to not draw it. And I, right. I had an orange highlighter, so. <laughs> and I think you could do a whole dream journal like that. Although some anyway. dreams are not, some of my dreams at least are not really drawable. Mm -hmm. They're just crazy, yeah. confused. Otherwise, I, I always dream I'm looking for a bathroom. And now yeah. I've trained my brain that when I'm looking for a bathroom, I probably should get out. Yeah, and that, <laughs> I think that's true for all of us. It's, yeah. it's your bladder's way of saying, you yeah. need to move. <laughs> yep. Yep. I think we all have those. Yeah. And sometimes I dream... I'm being strangled and I'll wake up and I have a CPAP and the CPAP hose will be wrapped around my neck. <laughs> it's like your brain is trying to tell you, untangle this mess, would you? Yeah. So what else? Any other thoughts about dreams or dreaming? What Can I say something else? Yeah, absolutely. Um, one of the things I've noticed that when I have the most vivid dreams, uh -huh. good, bad, and different, just ones that I really remember, I wake up um, in a sweat. Huh. Well, it, it wouldn't surprise me if, you know, our body's physiology affects our dreams at all. You know, that would make perfect sense to me. So hmm. if you're... If you're having, you know, night sweats or hormonal fluctuations or you're too hot or you're too cold, I, I bet that would have an impact on your dreams. That would oh, make sense okay. to me. Okay. I'm gonna I just post, didn't know if that was normal. Um, I, so I, I'm glad you asked that because what I'll say about normal is that there's no normal, that it's only normal for you. Um, okay. So, so in that case, I think everything's normal. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just um, wondered if other people had the same experience. Um, well, I know that I sleep lighter if I'm too hot. And I don't know if maybe that makes me remember fewer dreams if I'm too hot um, hmm. or not. I, I posted a, a document in the chat window, um, just some, some resources if you're interested in keeping up with dream journals, um, some books and some, there's a, an app um, you can look for. Um, so you can click on that PDF and download it to your own computers and save it for later if you'd like. Um, any other comments or questions? What do you guys think about dream journals? Someone wants us That's to repost really it. Great. Thank you. Well, thank you. Yeah, and I'll, I guess the last thing I'll say is that I, I write everything down. I mean, I don't hold back in my dream journals, and some of my dreams are pretty darn bizarre. Um, and, um, you know, there are some embarrassing moments in my dreams, <laughs> um, but I write all that down. 
and and I reserve the right to burn my journals at any point. So <laughs> that's the last thing I'll say. So thank you all very much for coming. Thank you. It was thank great. you. For, thank you for sharing with us. Oh yes, thank you for sharing. Yeah. Thank you to everyone. Um, come back and have your Ollies. If you're not from South Dakota, have your Ollies. Be sure and share our Ollie information. We're going to be sharing quite a few classes, not all of them, but quite a few um, this fall. And we also have a program called Ollie Platinum that you can find that's available to anyone. And it's um, actually, I just got an update that ding that it's ready on our website right now. Our website is USD, like in University of South Dakota, .edu slash Ollie. So join us and uh, I hope to see you all again. And thank you, Marcella. That was really great. Oh, it's thank my you. pleasure. All right. Thank you all. Thanks. Everybody take care. Bye-bye. Thank Stay you. Stay safe.